for having me. It's a pleasure. This is the fun part of my job, getting to talk to folks instead of just sitting in my kitchen by myself. Um, so uh, as Jake mentioned, I'm part of the COVID-19 Prevention Network, which is uh, based at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Um, the, the sort of short history about us is that um, we uh, originally existed as the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, which is funded by the part of the National Institutes of Health directed by Dr. Fauci, which is the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. And one of the things about working in HIV is that we already had this network of clinics which were um, staffed by researchers who had experience in infectious diseases, who had experience in vaccinology, um, who were accustomed to working in um, an environment where communities of color were disproportionately impacted. And so they had already been working to build their ties and relationships with those communities. Um, and they also had all of the other kinds of um, infrastructure in place like laboratories and pharmacies and so on. So last March, uh, 2020, Dr. Fauci directed us to become the operations center for the COVID-19 prevention network or the CoVPN. And so since last March, we have been uh, working in partnership with the different companies that have been developing the vaccines to run the clinical trials, to get those trials launched, to create the materials, to create public information campaigns, um, and to sort of promote COVID vaccines in general. So what I'm hoping to do today is to give you um, some background about the science to make sure that you all have um, kind of a, a fundamental understanding of the science behind these vaccines. And we'll try to address as many of your questions as we possibly can. So with that, let me dive in. Teresa, how am I doing on speed? Okay. <laughs> so this is the, the virus that we are gathered to discuss. I think it's probably become a, a fairly familiar image to everyone. Uh, we see it on the news and every sort of social media channel you can name. Um, and it's these little red spikes on the surface that are particularly of interest. And we'll be talking more about them. Um, what do they look like up close? So um, the name for these coronaviruses comes from this kind of a picture. And as you can see, the virus has this sort of a, almost like a halo of little spikes all around it that looks like a crown. Uh, and in Latin, a corona is the crown. But when you zoom in on one little spike, um, that's what you see on the right. It is this sort of bumpy, rough, three-dimensional uh, object. Um, and uh, it is colleagues at the NIH that um, do these wonderful graphics um, to, to show how they're arranged. And all of these different proteins come together. They um, I always joke that it looks like silly string, if any of you are old enough to remember what silly string is. Um, but there are these, this really, um, it's, it's important to recognize that these are not smooth surfaces. These are really three-dimensional, bumpy, ridged um, structures. And, and that becomes important as, as you'll see a little bit later. So the part of the reason that these, um, these spikes are so important is that they are the virus's landing gear. And if a virus can't land, it can't get into our cells and it can't use our cells machinery to make copies of, our, of itself, which is how a virus survives. If it can't replicate, it's dead. So, um, 
knowing where it's going to land and how it's going to attach when it does land, this is the essential piece of, uh, of information for understanding um, how these viruses work. So here's another way of, of looking at the virus, and this is highly magnified under a microscope. Um, the coronavirus is on the left in purple, um, and you can see one of these spike proteins kind of in the center of the screen. And on the right is a, a T cell in the human body. Um, and you can see that our cells have little bumps on their surface as well. These are known as receptors. And the spike protein is the landing gear that's gonna land and attach to that receptor. And when it does, it can bind on, and that is how that connection begins, uh, where it can then inject itself inside a human cell and start to make copies. Thankfully, our bodies have machinery that can prevent that from happening. And those are our antibodies. And our antibodies are shaped like the letter Y. They have kind of two arms at the top and a foot at the bottom. And those arms attach on to different facets of that spike protein. And when they do that, they're able to block the ability of that spike protein to connect onto that receptor on our cells. And you can kind of think of this if, um, is, uh, the, the virus is like the key going into a lock. And when they, when they connect, they make a tight connection that fits very snugly. But if you've got these antibodies that come along, they now create a new shape and suddenly that key won't fit in the lock. Um, and so that binding can't happen and we're able to prevent the virus from being able to attach onto our cells. Antibodies then can use their foot at the other end to pull the virus into the other structures of the immune system that are able to destroy the virus and shed it from the body. So let me give you a little uh, brief inside look into some basics of immunology and we'll dig into these concepts just a little bit more. So I like to think about um, our immune system like a tree. It has some major branches, some big thick trunks. Uh, and those, those big major parts have branches that shoot off, maybe some fruits, some leaves, some nuts. Um, we're not gonna get into all of the details of all of those pieces, but we'll try to just kind of touch on a few high level parts to help you make sense of the science. So we're gonna start with the adaptive immune system, and in particular, the part known as humoral. So adaptive, what does that even mean? When we're talking about our adaptive immune system, we're talking about what we acquire throughout our lifetimes. And so these are immune responses that are very specific to every different kind of germ we might come across. And the scientific name for those germs is the antigen. So you have a different immune response for the flu, for chicken pox, for the measles, for the mumps, for COVID. Each of these diseases has a unique, specific immune response. And what's interesting about them is that they take several days to really kick in and be fully functional, fully ready to go. Um, and we continue to develop this ability throughout our lifetimes. As you travel, you go to another country where there are different diseases in circulation, um, you're gonna continue to learn how to react to these different germs throughout your lifetime. 
So the first part of this adaptive response is our antibodies. And the scientific name for that is humoral. Um, and as you can see in my um, poor excuse for a cartoon on the right, uh, we've got our, our SARS-CoV-2 virus with all of its little protein spikes and our little Y-shaped antibodies. Um, and as you can see, the antibodies attach on to the outside of the virus to do their blocking. Um, so antibodies are made in part of our white blood cells, the B cells. And uh, usually within the first couple of days after we have an infection, uh, but they, antibodies can take really up to two weeks to be fully at you know, full power. Um, they have three different functions. So one of them, as I mentioned, is this ability to block or neutralize the virus. Um, a second is the ability to use their foot to eliminate the virus from the body. And the name for that is opsonization. And the third is that they are able to sensitize the immune system and call other parts of the immune response um, to come together and work together to fight an infection. So antibodies are able to prevent an infection outright, um, and they also have memory. And that's where vaccines are helpful because we can train your immune system to know what this new germ looks like so that it will remember if you're ever exposed to the real germ in the future. And so what this looks like, this little animation is gonna play and will repeat as I'm talking. So don't worry if you, if you miss any of it, you'll get to see it again. Um, this is you down at the bottom, you are the host. And in yellow is one of the cells of your body. And like we saw in the microscope image a moment ago, our cells have these little receptors on the surface, these little bumps. And so when a virus comes along, um, our antibodies are able to attach to those protein spikes on the surface, and they're able to block that virus from being able to attach onto our cell to cause an infection. And so this is what we mean when we say neutralize. It's able to prevent infection from even happening. So then the other piece of this is that the antibody, it's got its little arms attached to the virus. Now it's gonna put its foot to work as well. And so using that bottom end of the antibody, it can pull the virus into other specialized cells, the lysosomes, that I like to think of as our body's garbage disposal. Um, lysosomes are able to sort of wrap around a virus and engulf it and use the special chemical properties within that cell to um, destroy that virus, break it up into little bits, and then our body can shed it as waste. So we'll, um, you know, it'll, it'll be shed through our urine or through stool um, and be uh, excreted from the body. So this is the, the process of opsonization, how we clear that virus out. And I'll let this animation play through one more time. It gets broken up and shed. So then the third way, there we go. The third way that antibodies can work is by sensitizing the other parts of the immune system. And basically what happens is that our immune system recognizes that if an antibody has attached onto something, that something must not belong. It must be the bad guy, the enemy that should be gotten rid of. And so I think of this like old gangster movies 
Um, and so this is a, a frame from uh, Johnny of Johnny Depp in a gangster role. Um, but basically our antibodies are serving like the lookout. And if you've ever watched a gangster movie, you know that every good hitman needs a lookout. So the antibody is acting as the lookout and alerting the other kinds of cells in the immune response that have that killer function. And they enable the killers to be more effective because now it's literally like somebody going, woohoo, over here, pay attention to this one. This, this is the one, kill this one. And so now with that antibody attached, the cells that have killing properties can really be very focused and very efficient. And they will know that anything an antibody has attached to needs to go. And so there's different scientific terms that uh, are used for the different kinds of killer cells, but it's all the same principle. So the next piece of this adaptive response is the cellular response. And this is our T cells. And our T cells um, are, we, there are two main types that we pay attention to, the helpers and the killers. So the helper T lymphocytes and the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And I always tease that, you know, one name is never good enough for scientists. They have to have some god awful abbreviation of letters and numbers that no one will remember. Um, so, you know, if, if it's helpful for you to know the abbreviations, I've listed them there, um, but not critical. Uh, so, like our antibodies, um, our T cells also have memory, um, but different from antibodies, where, whereas an antibody can prevent an infection outright a T cell can only react after an infection happens and help to clear that infected cell out of the body and remove it. So these two types of cells, um, the CD4 positive are the helpers and they are the communicators. So like that person with a megaphone shouting to the crowd, um, these helper cells are really calling all of these other parts of the immune response. You know, hey, over here, we need you to come to this part of the body and, and pay attention over here. Uh, the killers, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, they are like that great white shark. They are jaws and all they do is kill and that is their only purpose. So together, calling all the players in, having really powerful killers, we can respond when an inf infection happens. So how is all of this working? Well, basically your adaptive response, um, these T cells are working like the watchman on the tower, that person who's always on lookout duty. Um, if any of you were Game of Thrones fans, here, these are your watchmen on the wall. Um, and they are literally surveilling your immune system at all times and looking throughout the body. Does, is there anything that doesn't look right? Doesn't look like it belongs? Looks like maybe it, it isn't a natural part of the human body. Maybe it's something foreign. Maybe it's something that's shaped incorrectly, um, like a, a tumor cell or some other kind of abnormality and that your immune system is gonna to respond then to any of these things that don't look proper. And, and that, is, that is the way that our immune systems are, are operating. So let me pause there for a minute just to sort of check in. And that was a lot of science and a lot of, in a very short amount of time. Is there anybody that has questions just about that to make sure that we're all hanging together? Not seeing anything so far, so I'm gonna press on, okay. So now let's think a little bit about how we make vaccines. How do we put this immune system functioning to work? 
So in vaccine development, we start with that scientist who has a bright idea and takes that idea into a lab to start looking at it first in test tubes, in petri dishes, with computer and mathematical modeling. Uh, we can do a lot of things uh, in the lab before we ever get to the point of, of putting it in a human being. And those ideas that seem promising in the lab um, can then be tested in animal models to start with. Um, usually starting with small animals like mice and rabbits um, and ultimately moving into larger animal models like non-human primates. Um, this particular picture is a, a rhesus macaque monkey. Uh, their immune system is very similar to the human immune system. So macaques are a, a frequent flyer in, uh, in vaccine development work. And based on what we see in the animal models, um, we then have to make a decision about whether we think it appears safe to move into human studies. When we move into human studies, we continue in this kind of stepwise uh, pace. And we start with a smaller phase one study. Um, these are usually about a year to a year and a half long. Um, we enroll a small group, usually less than 100 participants. Um, and we're enrolling people who are healthy and we're looking just to see, um, does the vaccine appear safe? Are there side effects? Do, are, are people able to tolerate those side effects pretty easily? Um, you know, does there, is there anything that looks worrisome? Uh, we're looking just at the safety. If that all looks good, we can continue into phase two. Um, those are studies usually a couple of years long uh, and usually enrolling several hundred participants. Um, now we're looking not only at the safety, but also at the immune responses. Are we getting the kinds of antibody and T cell responses in reaction to the vaccine that we think would be useful? And if all of that continues to go well, we ultimately move into a phase three study. Those typically take several years and we typically enroll thousands of people. And I would say that in an ordinary vaccine context, we would probably be talking around maybe five to 8,000 people, something in that, in that range. And so if we were to sort of diagram out this timeline, we would be looking at the, the preclinical work, that's the labs and the animal studies, and then these three phases of human studies, then um, a company could apply to the regulatory agencies like the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, for approval. They would then manufacture their product and begin to distribute it. And so if everything went perfectly according to plan, we probably are looking at about a 10 year process. And interestingly enough, this is one of the things that is causing the public the greatest concern right now, because they're seeing that in COVID, we were able to speed things up. And the sort of natural assumption is that surely we must have cut corners somewhere. Somehow we couldn't have gotten from 10 years to less than one year if we you know, somehow didn't cut some part of the process out. But no, <laughs> instead what happened is that we were able to do these studies in kind of an overlapping way. So instead of having to do everything one step following the next, um, we started the phase one study, uh, the, fir uh, the first phase one study for Moderna. I'll use Moderna as an example. Moderna opened their phase one study in March of 2020 at one clinic enrolling 50 people. As soon as they had their safety signal, they applied to the FDA and said, we wanna keep going. So the phase one study is still ongoing right now, but in parallel, in May, they opened their phase two study. 
and started looking at the immune responses. And again, that phase two study is still going on right now. Those volunteers continue to be followed. But in parallel, in July, we were able, we had enough information that it was deemed safe to continue. And in July, the phase three study began. Now the expectation was that it was gonna, gonna take about seven months before we would have enough information to move ahead with being able to roll out the vaccine. And instead what happened was we got our safety data and the epidemic uh, really just ballooned in ways we didn't predict. And we were able to get that answer in about four or five months instead of seven months. And even as that was happening, the federal government invested financial resources and told the companies to go ahead and start manufacturing doses in advance in anticipation of having the study outcomes. So that if we were lucky and it got a favorable study result, there would be doses of vaccine ready to go and we wouldn't have to wait for that manufacturing time to happen. But we would, um, it's, it's referred to as, as um, manufacturing at risk because had the studies had the opposite result and we found out that the vaccine was no good, we would have had to just destroy those doses and the government would have lost that investment, that money would have been gone. Um, but because the federal government is able to take on that financial risk, it meant that the companies could really move ahead in a much faster manner and didn't have to spend time fundraising and selling shares of stock to finance this research, which is usually part of the process. So instead, here we were being able to kind of overlap all of these steps and do them simultaneously, um, still proceeding with all of the same safety checks, all of the same oversight, the same kinds of data monitoring and safety monitoring, not a single step was skipped. They were just done in this overlapping manner rather than one after the next. And so here we are, the Moderna vaccine that first began clinical trials in March uh, had a favorable result in November and was able to get their um, emergency use authorization in December and begin distributing their product. And again, I'm using Moderna just as one example, but it's the same for all the companies. To give you another idea of how this speed comes into play. This is a really busy slide. Don't worry about trying to take it all in. Um, what I want you to sort of notice is that what is being shown here is about a three month period of time from late December 2019 till the middle of March 2020. And what was unusual about this particular coronavirus was that the scientists in China were able to sequence the virus and make that data public in record time. So the, the virus genetic sequence was published in January. Um, and within days, um, the Vaccine Research Center, the VRC, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, um, turned that genetic sequence into the genetic code to be used in the vaccine. And they identified the particular way to make that landing gear, that, that little spike protein um, in, a, in a way that would be stable and that could be um, safely carried in the vaccine. So that was the first part of this speed um, we had never before had a virus that was 
genetically sequenced within just a matter of weeks. And then, you know, a protein ready to go um, again within less than a month. And all of these other steps that follow are then on this fast track as well. So being able to manufacture these, um, these proteins, being able to work with the different companies um, to allow them to uh, get it into their different vaccine platforms. Um, again, I'm using Moderna here just as one example, but it's the, the same kind of thing happening across all the different companies. And so what we saw was that basically within two months of having that, um, that genetic sequence, we could launch a phase one vaccine trial. We had a product in the vials that had been all of the quality testing done. Um, we knew it was stable. We knew how to freeze it and keep it at the right temperature and so on. And we were ready to go. So that's really where the speed starts is, is on the, the science end of things. By contrast, and this is what's shown with the lines at the bottom of the slide, the fastest timeline we've seen previously was uh, with the vaccine against the Zika virus that you may remember from several years back. Um, and in Zika, that, that first part of genetic sequencing took three months and getting um, a process um, to have a vaccine in a vial took another three months. So, um, you know, a little, actually a little over six months. So for, you know, whatever reason, everybody really pulled together with coronavirus and we were able to speed things up really from the start. So now thinking about how vaccines work. Um, what a vaccine is really doing is teaching your body how to recognize this invader. Um, I happen to love this particular image because it seems like no matter what culture you come from anywhere in the world, you recognize these guys coming at you with swords as the bad guys. And in the same way, the vaccine is teaching your body how to recognize coronavirus as the bad guy. But the vaccine also teaches your body how to summon the good guys. And in this case, it's those very cells and proteins that we just talked about. Um, the body now recognizes the coronavirus, sounds the alarm, it uses those helper cells to summon the troops. And all of those fighter cells and antibodies can be called into action just like a fireman. And again, every culture in the world has firemen. We know them as the good guys. Um, and just like a fireman comes in to put out the fire, that's exactly what our body is doing. We wanna put out the coronavirus. Um, we either want to prevent it from causing an infection in the first place, we wanna block it, or we wanna be able to control it and have the T cells clear that infection out of the body. So historically, the ways that vaccines have been made used two different technologies. Um, and most people have heard about these two technologies because they're the ways that were used to make the two different polio vaccines, the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine, uh, named for the researchers that discovered them. Um, and those two methods of vaccine manufacturing um, actually use the real virus. Um, and they either attenuate it, which means weaken, and they weaken and weaken and weaken and weaken it till it's just sort of a shadow of its original self, or they do something to it to inactivate it, um, usually using heat or radiation or chemicals to, um, to inactivate the vaccine so that it is no longer uh, able to cause infection. And I've listed on the slide, there are some examples of other vaccines that you may be familiar with that are made using these technologies. So 
what's interesting about these is that when you have a new virus where we don't know a whole lot yet about how it works and how it impacts the body, these technologies are a little risky because we don't know how much we would need to weaken it. We don't know how much heat or chemicals or radiation would be necessary to inactivate it. And rather than take the risk um, and, and create a situation where somebody might actually be able to get infected because they got vaccinated, we wanna avoid that. And so these older traditional technologies have not been used at all in, with coronavirus. Uh, they literally just put them on a shelf, never, never tried. Um, the thing that's amusing about that is that this is what many people remember. The one thing perhaps that you retained from your junior high or high school biology class um, is often that I, I thought vaccines use the real germ in the vaccine. And I cannot tell you how many times I've come across that question in the public. Um, so we have to spend a lot of time talking about the fact that your memory is correct. Though that is a way that vaccines can be made, but it is not the way these vaccines against the coronavirus are being made. And so as a result, we can be really confident and say that it is not possible to get infected with the coronavirus because of getting the vaccine. It's just not possible. So how are we making it then? Well, besides those two old technologies, which I've crossed out here in red, um, there are a number of other newer technologies that can be used. And those newer technologies, you probably have heard with names like genetic engineering. Um, they is how they often get lumped together. Uh, more specifically, now that we actually are hearing about the companies that are developing these products, and some of these products are now approved, we're hearing more about the, the specific names of these different technologies. So on the uh, bottom uh, towards the center, we have the Moderna and Pfizer products, which are made using mRNA or messenger RNA technology. Um, on the left, we have viral vectors. Um, the word recombinant means that it's been changed so that the, the virus that's being used cannot cause an infection with that virus either. Uh, and that is what AstraZeneca and uh, Janssen or Johnson and Johnson um, are using um, for, re <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you call it Johnson & Johnson or whether you call it Janssen, one is the name they use in the US and one is the name they use globally, but it's the same company. And um, over on the right, we have um, two companies that you probably haven't heard too much about yet. And it's because their studies are still ongoing. Um, the Novavax and Sanofi vaccines use a subunit protein. And knowing that there's all these different technologies, I, I don't think it's important that you necessarily remember which is which um, or even the details of how they work. I just want you to know that there's different ways using more modern technology to make vaccines. And we're not relying on those two older traditional methods that have some safety risks. These newer technologies, none of them use the real virus and none of them are able to cause an infection. The other strategy that you may have heard a little bit about um, that's on the sort of the lower right is monoclonal antibodies. And um, this got a little bit of attention um, because uh, former President Trump uh, received one of those antibodies as a treatment. Um, these are laboratory manufactured antibodies. So instead of your own natural ones, we can give you an IV infusion of laboratory made antibodies to help boost your response and help you um, have protection. 
And so we have two of those now as well, uh, made by Regeneron and Lily. So again, just to reiterate, the, these newer technologies, it is not possible for them to cause an infection. And the reason for that is that they're not using the whole virus. They're using either pieces that have been copied from the virus or genetic code that teaches your body how to make pieces from the virus. And so just like if you had a, a wheel and handlebars and a chain, that could not give you a working bicycle. You would just have three pieces. In the same way, if you had some RNA or some membrane or some protein spikes, those are just pieces copied out of a virus and they don't have the ability to magically combine themselves and create an entire working virus that could cause an infection. So what are we hoping to learn from these vaccine studies? Um, this has been a source of a, a great deal of confusion. Um, the media has frequently gotten the message wrong with this. So to be clear, the, the primary question from these studies is whether we can help people create an immune response that's going to protect them against the severe complications of COVID-19 illness. And we think of those as hospitalization and death. So with this brand new virus that we're still learning about, that we still don't know a lot about how it works, the most important issue from a public health standpoint was to not overwhelm our public health systems. And so we needed to make sure that people could continue to, you know, even if you don't feel so well and you, you know, maybe you feel miserable in fact, but you could feel miserable at home and you wouldn't require hospitalization, ICU care, a ventilator, uh, and certainly we wanna prevent death. As a secondary question, we also are looking at, can the vaccine actually protect you from getting infected in the first place? But that's a secondary question, and we still don't know the answer to that. We have some clues, but we're still learning, and the studies are still ongoing. So even though the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer, even though those vaccines have approval, the people are still enrolled in the studies, and we continue to follow them and continue to take blood samples to learn more about how these immune responses work. So with these phase three studies, we wanna continue to monitor safety as well. And again, we do that through the, the collection of, of blood samples throughout the study. We ask people to report their side effects after vaccination. So for example, that's how we know, you know that you might have a sore arm, you might have a fever, uh, you might have um, some aches and pains or, or feel chills. Um, those are the kinds of things that people have reported in the clinical trials. We also want to know how well people tolerate those side effects. And so that's where we've learned, for example, that most people seem to recover from these side effects within a day or two. And maybe they need to take some Tylenol. Uh, maybe they need to, you know, take a, a hot shower or soak in a bath so that their sore arm uh, can can get a little uh, relief. But that's that's what we're talking about when we talk about tolerability: is how well does the body manage those side effects? So again, we're talking about the importance of this spike protein, this little red guy here. Um, and so all of the vaccines that are being tested, um, it was originally called Operation Warp Speed under the previous administration. Under the new administration, they haven't come up with a better name, but they tend to just call it the operation for short. Um, 
And so all of these studies that received US government funding are using this same protein as the key ingredient of the vaccine. So the different companies may manufacture the vaccine using different methods, but they're all using that same key piece um, to see if we can trigger the immune response. So what do we think the vaccines can do? What we hope is that they're gonna cause this terrific antibody response and that would prevent infection in the first place. <coughs> Excuse me. We also hope that we're gonna trigger this terrific T cell response. And if we do that, then our body would be able to identify if there were any cells that got infected and it would clear them out. So a SARS-CoV-2 infection would never develop into being COVID-19 disease. We could nip it in the bud. And maybe if the T cell response wasn't quite as strong, maybe we only do so-so, then what we would hope is that we could perhaps control that infection a little bit, slow it down, um, keep it in check to some degree so that you wouldn't get as sick um, or you might have illness that is uh, lasts for a shorter period of time. And to think about an example of that in the real world, I want you to think about what you've heard about the flu shot every year. And you've probably heard that even if it doesn't protect the flu perfectly, you'll have a less severe uh, case of the flu. Maybe it'll last three days instead of five days. That's the, the sort of thing that we're talking about with a kind of so-so immune response. The other thing that we hear a lot about, and again, the media is getting this one wrong Every time I turn around, it's making me crazy. Uh, some nights listening to the news, my head feels like it's gonna explode, um, is this idea of herd immunity. Um, what we've heard from communities is that they don't like being compared to animals very much. And so we've been trying to actually not use the term herd immunity. And we're trying to get people to talk about it as population immunity or if you like rhymes, community immunity. Um, it's a little hard to say, <laughs> but this is the idea of protecting the broader public. So not just protecting the person who gets the shot, but protecting the people around them that they may interact with. And so to help you understand why the news is getting this wrong, let me show you a, a couple of slides of images here. So the idea of this population immunity comes from vaccines that actually prevent infection in the first place. So you have to remember that for coronavirus, we don't know yet if it prevents infection in the first place. So everything that you hear about population immunity for SARS-CoV-2, you have to sort of take it with a grain of salt because it's all, we're speculating a little bit. We think that we may be able to achieve the same kind of thing, but we just don't know for sure how it's gonna work. So with other vaccines where we do know that they prevent infection, the idea is that, you know, along comes this new virus and nobody has any natural immunity to it because it's new. So that virus is able to quickly spread. So in this image, the people who are shown in blue are all susceptible to being infected and many, many people become red uh, because they are becoming ill. We don't have any immunization yet we don't have any natural immunity. So we have this really widespread effect. And if you think back, that's kind of where we were like in January of 2020 or even last spring as we were seeing the epidemic unfold in Italy and in Spain and so forth, in England. 
But once there is a vaccine that can protect against infection and people start getting vaccinated, now we've got these folks in yellow and you'll see they've got their little shield, they're protected, right? And so it now becomes harder for that virus to spread because there aren't as many people who are susceptible to infection. And the result of that is on the right side of the slide, that now those people with their shields, those immunized people can be the protectors of the people around them. Because if they can't get sick, then the people that they come in contact with probably will not get sick either because those people that have been immunized would not be able to transmit the virus to someone else. And so this becomes really important because we know that there are some people in society that will not be able to get vaccinated. Babies that, or children that are too young, people that have some sort of a, a immune compromising illness, such as anybody with cancer that's undergoing chemotherapy uh, as one example. And so those people who are protected from being vaccinated are gonna provide kind of a ring of protection um, because they won't be able to transmit. And so that's where this idea of population protection starts to come into play. And as you can see on the, on the right here, you know, these vaccinated people are really forming a, a circle of protection around that unvaccinated individual. But again, this is still guesswork because for coronavirus, we don't know if these vaccines prevent infection and we're still learning about whether they can prevent transmission or not. We don't have solid data on that yet. So why are these coronavirus vaccines different? Um, this is what I've been saying. So this is where the guidance comes from that um, it's important to continue, even after you get your vaccine, it's important to think about wearing your mask, staying separate, trying not to gather in crowds, all of that same public health advice and guidance that you've been hearing for months now continues to be really important and continues to be true. And it reflects what we don't know yet. Um, so for example, the vaccines are great at protecting severe COVID-19. We haven't seen hospitalizations. We haven't seen deaths. Fabulous. But that means that some people might still be getting a mild case of COVID-19. And it may feel kind of like having the sniffles or a mild cold. Well, if you've got the sniffles, then you've got virus in your nose. And it's still possible to transmit that virus to others if you sneeze or if you're projecting your voice to the crowd, right? So that mask is now about protecting others. And so when you hear these projections about what percentage of the population um, has to get vaccinated to have population immunity, I want you to just sort of be a, a critical thinker, be a little bit skeptical and, and remind yourself that we still don't know um, how these vaccines are gonna work and what it will take to achieve population immunity. So that was a whole lot of information. Again, let me just sort of check in quickly for understanding and make sure folks are hanging with me and we'll get to the open Q&A at the end. Have I said anything that completely made you scratch your head or stumped you? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions pop up, so I'm gonna continue on. So let's talk a little bit about these exciting new vaccines that we have. The first two that came out were from uh, Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, they have their emergency use authorization, EUA, um, and they both are using this messenger RNA or mRNA technology. Both of them are vaccines that are given in a two-dose regimen, 
Uh, Pfizer is given ideally about three weeks apart and Moderna ideally about four weeks apart. There's wiggle room there. And we heard a lot of concern about this initially when uh, there weren't enough vaccine doses to go around and people were worried about spreading the timing out. What happens if I get it at six weeks or two months? Is that a problem? There's some wiggle room. Um, the, the key is to have that second booster dose. Um, and, and I'll come back to why that matters in a minute. So how does this mRNA work? Um, mRNA is the instructions. It's like the recipe card. Um, it doesn't actually have any of the virus itself. It's just the genetic code for how to make that spike protein. And what it's doing when it gets injected into your muscle in your arm, that muscle cell that received the instructions now has the recipe and knows how to use that cell in your muscles natural machinery and make copies of that spike protein. And it's gonna display them on the surface of that muscle cell because it's proud of its work. It wants to show it off. It's gonna put it out there for the body to see. Look what I did, I made a protein, right? But now your immune system can see that protein and your immune system doesn't care whether it actually came from the coronavirus originally or if your muscle made a copy, doesn't matter. Your immune system recognizes that protein as something foreign that doesn't belong. So it launches that whole antibody and T cell process that we just spoke about earlier. And so in this way, um, the, the mRNA is, is just delivering the instructions and it's letting your body do all the work of, of teaching itself how to recognize the virus and how to react to it. Now, one of the things that you've probably heard a lot about is that these mRNA vaccines have to be kept very cold. And the reason for that is that just like ingredients in a recipe, sometimes there are some things that you store at room temperature. There are some things that have to be refrigerated or frozen and vaccines are no different. So the ingredients in this vaccine, this genetic code, remain stable when they're kept frozen. And so we wanna keep that vaccine frozen until it's time to administer it into a person. And then you thaw it out and you have a, a set period of time to use the contents of that thawed out vial. Well, when that vaccine gets given to you, obviously your body is a good deal warmer than a freezer. And so now that mRNA is going to heat up in your body. And what is happening is that it starts to degrade because it gets warm. So within a day or two, that mRNA sort of disintegrates and it goes away. And you don't have any more RNA Left, it, left in you. What you have is cells that know how to make that protein and show it to your immune system. So the mRNA that was introduced with the vaccine fades away within a couple days, but your body is left with the instructions and knows how to make th this protein. So when you come along with the second dose, roughly three or four weeks later, now your body sees that injection again and goes, wait a minute, I've seen this before. So now we know that the body's really gonna turn on the, the full guns because I've seen that before, I'm gonna react because that looks like it could be an infection. So this is why people are having more significant side effects after the second dose because your body is really going full blazes to fight back against that booster injection of the vaccine. So what's interesting, again, people have the perception that this is somehow new and that makes it untrustworthy. Um, 
In fact, this is technology that's been in development for going on 20 years um, at the Vaccine Research Center. Um, it's been developed um, initially for other diseases. It was looked at first uh, for use with Ebola. Um, and it has just kind of been percolating along. The, the, the work on the research side has been moving along. And I think that what we've seen here is this sort of perfect timing of different research teams coming together. Um, Dr. Kizmekia Corbett is the lead researcher at the Vaccine Research Center that has been working on this spike protein technology and the genetic code. Um, so for anyone who was concerned about were people of color involved, um, is this new, uh, all of those kinds of doubts and fears, I want you to know that a black woman developed this vaccine and she's been working on it for more than a decade already. Um, but be, with her work and this mRNA technology work happening at Pfizer and Moderna, we now had this perfect combination of partners to put the, the protein technology into the mRNA vaccine and manufacture it. Um, Kizzy is an amazing woman. If you ever see an interview of her anywhere or have an opportunity to hear her speak, she's really engaging. She's really lovely. Um, so again, you know, this is not new. This is not fast. It's been going on for years. Uh, people are just sort of hearing about it for the first time because it's the first mRNA vaccine that has gotten FDA approval to be rolled out to the public. <clears throat> so the benefits of these mRNA vaccines, we know that they work great against hospitalization and, and the severe symptoms. We know that they work great at preventing deaths. Um, and they, the clinical trials did a really nice job of enrolling a very diverse group of people we had excellent representation from all different racial and ethnic minority groups. We had great representation of older adults with, um, and of people with a variety of kinds of other health conditions. So um, we did not enroll just healthy people, but we enrolled people that had uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, they were overweight, they had other kinds of heart and lung disorders. Um, again, because we knew from seeing people get sick with COVID that those were conditions that made you have a worse case of COVID. So you want to make sure that your vaccine is going to impact the people that need it the most. And so those are the people that we sought to enroll. Um, and so we, we did a nice job um, in these studies that enrolled 30,000 or more people, we got these really great um, mixed groups, um, mixed in every sense of the word. And now we have this new kid on the block, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, which has been developed by uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Dan Baruch, who is at um, the COVID-19 He's part of our management team, excuse me, at the COVID-19 Prevention Network. He's also been working on the same technology for an HIV vaccine. And we have um, studies of those uh, going on now. Um, the same technology has also been used already um, in a vaccine that is approved and being distributed across Africa in countries where Ebola is um, having an effect. And we have re uh, other vaccines being studied for HIV, malaria, Zika, and uh, respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV for short. Um, those are all in advanced stages of research. Um, this is the idea of using another virus that we know does a good job of infecting people. It's good at sneaking past your immune system and causing illness. Um, and, and we wanna use that as kind of our delivery vehicle. It's, it's the Amazon truck, if you will. Um, and it's been engineered, it's recombinant, its proteins have been rearranged so that it cannot actually cause a cold. 
You won't actually get sick because of this carrier. Um, but it, um, we then take that same protein that Kismekia Corbett developed and we splice it in. And so now our little delivery virus carries a cargo and it gets into your muscle and releases that cargo. And then the rest of the process is the same. So we know that these adenovirus, um, this particular vaccine uses adenovirus type 26, which is one of the more rare strains. Most people have never been exposed to adenovirus type 26 before. Um, but you know, if, if any of you have ever been around a toddler, you know how good cold viruses are at spreading between people. They are sneaky little devils and it doesn't take a whole lot of contact for a cold virus to pass between, you know, members of a household or students in a classroom. They, they are really good at getting into our bodies and, and, you know, causing illness. So we've, we've engineered the virus so it won't cause a cold, but it's still really good at sneaking in and getting past your immune system. So it can get into your muscle, your muscle can start taking that protein code and, and churning out little copies of spike protein and your immune system will be able to react um, just like the same way the mRNA vaccines work. Um, so what do we still need to learn? We still, you know, and I mentioned these studies are all still ongoing. These 30,000 plus volunteers per company are all still being followed in these ongoing studies. So we're still looking at this question of does the virus prevent against getting infected in the first place? Um, and, and can people still transmit it to someone else if they get sick? We still need to know more about how long the effects of the vaccine last. And the only way to answer that question is to follow these study participants for time. The studies were designed to go for two week, or for two years, excuse me. Um, and so we're continuing to learn. And they come in on a regular schedule and provide blood samples so that we can look at what is the level of antibodies? What is the level of T cells that are in their blood so that we'll have an understanding of how long these vaccine responses last and when it, uh, it might be appropriate if people need to get some sort of a booster shot, for example. So we'll, we'll be able to find that out. And the only way we are gonna find out that answer is to let time play out. And then we wanna find out as well about these groups of people that were not included in the studies originally. So children, uh, people who are pregnant and people who had compromised immune systems. And so we're now starting to look at studies specifically designed to enroll these groups. And um, now that we have some initial data about the safety, um, we feel that it's appropriate to move ahead and start looking at these vulnerable groups and, and see how the vaccines work for them more particularly. Um, we're also continuing to look at these other vaccines. So you've probably heard about AstraZeneca, which has already been approved in some other countries, but is not yet approved in the United States. Um, it uses a similar technology to Johnson & Johnson with an adenovirus vector, um, where Johnson & Johnson used the type 26 variety. They used an adenovirus that um, causes colds in chimpanzees. It's a, a chimpanzee cold virus. So um, we're still waiting. Uh, that study is fully enrolled. We're waiting for all the safety data to accumulate and, and move that forward. Uh, Novavax is, um, actually, I forgot to update this. This is another study that is now fully enrolled. Uh, it has over 30,000 people in it. I believe it was 32,000 and change. Um, this is a, a protein vaccine where we're actually giving people that spike protein. 
And then Sanofi um, is still uh, gearing up as well. They are working to identify the optimal dose. They have some early stage studies underway to find out what is the best amount of vaccine people need to get. And they have their large study uh, expecting to open probably around May or June. Um, again, we still need to look at these vaccines in these um, vulnerable groups. But if we wanna have enough doses of vaccine to be able to administer to the population of the whole world, we need to have more vaccines. Uh, so one of the things that's unique about Sanofi, since they're a little slower uh, running behind the other, the other companies, they are gonna be the first company specifically looking at a vaccine that is designed to uh, resemble the South African identified variant of the virus. Um, and so <clears throat> to speak about variants for just a minute, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that this protein spike is sort of ridged and bumpy on the surface. And all viruses mutate. It sounds really scary, but every virus does that. And it does that to keep itself alive because once your body learns how to fight it with antibodies, uh, it doesn't have a host anymore. So if it wants to keep alive and keep replicating, it has to figure out ways to avoid your immune system. So what's unique about SARS-CoV-2 is that it's mutating in ways beyond what we would ordinarily expect. And specifically, some of those extra mutations are on that bumpy surface of the spike protein, um, allowing it to basically be slippery and, and get away from the antibody being attached to it. Um, so that's what these different um, variants that have been identified in different countries. Uh, we have a variant first identified in England, a variant first identified in South Africa, a variant first identified in Brazil. Uh, there's, we've been hearing more about one in Denmark. There's one being uh, labeled from California, one from New York. So as there are lots of cases, there are lots of variants. So we want to try to see more about how these vaccines will work against these um, different variants that have been identified. Um, one of the ways that you can think about these vaccines, if, if you find yourself getting bogged down in the science and you're hearing people talk about, well, which vaccine is better than another? And, you know, I heard this and I heard that. Um, we talk in our program about uh, vaccines being like building a sandwich. And what I want you to know is that just like if you were to ask 10 people, what's the best sandwich? Somebody's going to tell you ham and cheese. Somebody's going to tell you peanut butter and jelly. Someone's going to tell you tuna fish and so on and so on, right? Everybody has an opinion. Well, in the same way, all of these vaccines so far, they all work great. They've all been over 95, excuse me, over 90%, and in some cases, even 100% effective at preventing serious illness and death. And that was our number one goal. They may have some differences about how well they work in terms of preventing infection or how well they work against these variant viruses. And that detail is still coming out. But what this, what this graphic is trying to show you is the different technologies all boil down to the same set of ingredients. We've got our mRNA vaccines that use the genetic code, which I told you is like using the recipe card, right? It doesn't actually need any of the real virus. We've got these vaccines that use a vector, the, like Johnson & Johnson, which is uh, like a, a carrier. So you could think of that like the bread, right? It helps you carry the sandwich from the plate to your mouth. It's, it's gonna deliver whatever its sandwich filling is. Then we've got our sandwich filling and they're all using the same filling. They're all using spike protein. So no matter what you think the best kind of sandwich is, 
in coronavirus, the best filling is spike protein. And that's the only way we're making our sandwich. And then the other product that is a little different from, from company to company is that you might also use um, what we like to talk about as the condiments on our sandwich. And a couple of the companies, uh, Novavax and uh, Sanofi in particular, are using uh, a product called an adjuvant, which is uh, basically an immune booster. It helps your immune system have a stronger reaction. So you could think of this like putting a little hot sauce or a little spicy mustard or horseradish on your, on your sandwich. It's that little extra oomph, little something something to, to give your sandwich a kick. So if you find yourself getting bogged down in the science, you can come back to this sort of uh, um, idea of the sandwich. And just remember that each of the companies is doing something slightly different. They might use different bread, a different kind of carrier. They might use a different adjuvant, a different booster. Um, but they're all, they're all making spike protein sandwiches. So at the end of the day, the best vaccine is the one you can get. Because so far, what we've seen is that they all work really well. I've already talked about this. We wanna have as many vaccines as we can so that we can really get the doses out to the community. And I wanna now really start hitting on your questions. So some, many of you submitted questions in advance. <clears throat> um, Eileen just put a comment in the chat. Thank you so much for that kind compliment. I appreciate that. Um, so we've heard lots of questions about the side effects. And what we've seen is that the side effects from the COVID vaccines are very similar to what people experience with any of the other licensed and approved vaccines. Um, what we have seen is that they're quite similar to um, influenza, which many of us are already familiar with. And if you happen to be over age 50, you might have gotten your shingles vaccine, uh, which is sold under the brand name Shingrix. Um, so these are the kinds of things that are mostly local, a sore arm, maybe it's a little red, maybe it's a little swollen, um, having a headache, feeling some sort of body aches and pains or aches in your joints or muscles, um, having a low grade fever, all perfectly ordinary, usually resolve within one to two days. Uh, most people find that they might wanna take a nap, take some Tylenol, um, maybe have a, a hot shower, a hot bath to soak your arm. Um, heat, heat feels nice. Um, and that's about it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty minor. Um, we hear a lot of uh, fuss on the news about anaphylaxis, which is a severe allergic reaction. And I remind people that the, um, one of the truths about the news media is that if it bleeds, it leads. So one case of anaphylaxis makes the national news. But the truth is that anaphylaxis is incredibly rare. Um, and so this is data that was reported in January. I'm sure there's probably an update, um, but quite honestly, I just haven't had time to look for it. Um, but what we had seen with Pfizer and Moderna was you know, less than two dozen cases of anaphylaxis in millions of doses of vaccine administered. So we're talking about something super duper rare. Um, and if you are a person who has allergies already, and if you've ever had an allergic reaction to a vaccine in the past, you're encouraged to talk with your own personal doctor before you go for a COVID vaccine. Um, in all likelihood, it will be fine for you to get a COVID vaccine, but you, it's, it's definitely something to talk about with your own doctor and get advice that is specific for you and your unique health considerations. Um, for most people, you'll get your vaccine and you'll need to be monitored for about 15 minutes afterward. This is when most people who are gonna have an allergic reaction will have it. If, if it's gonna happen, it usually happens fast. So they'll have you sit there for about 15 minutes, make sure you're feeling okay, 
and then you'll be released to go. Um, if you are somebody who has a history of allergic reactions, they monitor you twice as long and they'll have you stay for about a half hour. Um, they might also do things like making sure that they have an EpiPen sitting right nearby so that in case it's needed, it's available, it's ready to go and nobody's looking for emergency supplies. Um, but most people that have a, a history of allergic reactions that have been uh, vaccinated have been just fine. And they, they might have needed that EpiPen, but um, they've been able to be treated and do just fine. So it's, it's again, best to seek advice from your own doctor. I, I, um, I don't wanna mislead anyone. Um, we hear a lot about, I don't think I wanna be first. You know, I wanna wait and see I want to let some other people get vaccinated first and you know make sure I'm I'm comfortable with what I hear about from other people first. Well, at this point, over 40 million Americans have gotten these vaccines. Um, not to mention the global populations that have been getting these vaccines. So the time has come. We we, we a whole lot of other people have gotten these vaccines. So if you encounter people who are in that wait and see group, you can tell them that they have waited long enough. And we now really have a great body of data to say that it is safe to get these vaccines. There's two different systems that are used to monitor safety. Um, one is called uh, Be Safe. And when you go to get your vaccine, you'll get a handout about the Be Safe program. I'm showing my handout uh, on my camera. And uh, VSafe is something that you sign up for uh, if you have a smartphone. And um, it'll send you text message reminders. And it'll ask you to record any symptoms and how you're feeling. And it does this at, at pre-specified times. So um, every day for the first week after your shot, and then weekly for a couple of weeks. Um, I just, I'm going for my shot number two tomorrow. So I actually got my little reminder message last week that said, don't forget to schedule your second appointment. Um, so it, it sends out little helpful reminders. But even if you don't have a smartphone, doesn't matter because the second monitoring system is one that doctor's offices and hospitals use. Um, its acronym is the VAERS system. And if you were to go and seek any medical care because you had a side effect, maybe you thought it was worrisome, maybe it lasted longer than a couple of days and you thought it should get checked out. So you go to seek medical care. Um, the VARES system is where your healthcare provider will enter information about that side effect. So we've got these two different systems that kind of work hand in hand to monitor safety. Um, again, you know, we're seeing, um, oh, here's another slide I missed updating. Uh, that 21,000 number um, death, death toll is obviously quite out of date. Um, we now have over 500,000 deaths in the United States. Um, that had at one time been a, a one week count of 21,000 uh, deaths in an individual week, but that that was from a presentation I did a month ago. Apologies, I forgot to update the slide. Um, we do want to remind people that it takes about two weeks after your vaccination, um, or if, if in the case of the Pfizer and Moderna where you have to get two shots, it's about two weeks after the second shot before you can consider yourself fully protected. And again, if you remember back to the start of my talk, that's because antibodies take about two weeks to really be at full strength, ready to go. Um, what we know about these new strains of COVID, these variants uh, or mutations of COVID-19 that have been identified is that they're more contagious. Um, and so they're easier to spread. So the quicker that we can get people vaccinated, the less the variants matter. Because if people are protected, then the virus has nowhere to spread and it can't mutate. The, the mutations can only happen if the virus is continuing to be transmitted. 
So our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as fast as we possibly can so that we can try to nip these variants in the bud as much as possible. Um, we've heard concerns from people that somehow the mRNA vaccines could somehow integrate with our body's own natural DNA and cause bad things to happen. Um, what, what you need to know is that the mRNA in the vaccine never gets to the part of the cell where DNA lives. DNA is in the cell's nucleus and the mRNA never crosses that nucleus uh, barrier. So it's, it's not possible for them to interact. Um, and then as I me mentioned earlier, the mRNA is degrading as it heats up in your body. And so it's, it's gradually disintegrating and is leaving your body within a couple days. The other vaccine technologies work much the same way that you know they're, they're designed to get in there, deliver their important information, and then they disintegrate and fade away. Um, a, a variety of photos, uh, regardless of political persuasion of some of our um, important public figures who've gotten their vaccines, the Surgeon General, Dr. Fauci, uh, the first nurse in, uh, in New York at the lower left, uh, Vice President Harris, President Biden, and former Vice President Pence. Um, mentioned this already, the importance of wearing a mask even after you get vaccinated, maintaining distancing. Again, this is because we still don't know that um, whether you can be infected after vaccination, um, we want to be sure that you're not going to transmit to anyone else. Um, is one dose as effective as two? People are worried about this Johnson & Johnson product that's given just in a single shot. And um, the, uh, the design of the vaccines is different. So the mRNA vaccines were designed to be given in two doses. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was designed to be given as a single dose. Um, interestingly, Johnson & Johnson does have another study underway right now that's looking at a two-dose regimen. So when that study has its data ready to report, if we find out that two doses of Johnson & Johnson is better, we may see some new guidance come out to tell people, you know, hey, you should go back and get a booster, or, you know, maybe our, our guidance will change and we'll give it as a two-dose regimen from the, from the outset. So stay tuned, more news to come from ongoing studies. Um, uh, oh, I forgot I put that slide in. So that's exactly what I just said. Um, but again, the, the take home message is the best vaccine is the one you can get. You should not be worried about which version of vaccine you're getting. Go with what you can get, follow the directions for that vaccine, call it good. How can I get vaccinated in Washington? This of course is the million dollar question. Um, the state created the findyourphasewa.website, which um, links you up to all of the different facilities that are offering vaccination appointments. Um, there's also a toll free phone number. If you know people that don't have the technology or don't have hours to sit chasing around online, clicking on links, um, trying to find an appointment, you can call the toll-free number. Um, I have to be honest and tell you that you're likely to sit on hold for a fair amount of time. It's, it's not as easy as just making a phone call. Um, the phone line does offer Spanish interpretation as well. Um, and there is also an alternate number. If you're finding the wait times, um, there's an 888 alternative as well. Um, just this past weekend, there was the exciting development that here in Seattle, uh, they have opened a mass vaccination site down by the stadiums at the Lumen Field Event Center. Um, and that is a facility that is prepared to give over 20,000 shots a day. But the key is they have to receive the vials of vaccine to be able to give them. 
So as more vials of vaccine are distributed to states and become available, we'll continue to see the number of people moving through that facility grow. Um, I think that what I heard was over the weekend, they were starting with about 500 per day. So I'm sure that we'll see that continuing to increase. I mentioned this earlier, how long does immunity last? We don't know yet. We've just got to follow people for time. How are these mutations going to affect the vaccines? Still learning on this one as well. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're, we're starting to look at these questions of whether we might need some sort of booster, if we might need to do something different and tweak the vaccine to make it more responsive to these variants. That's what's uh, coming up in the new studies that are being designed and implemented right now. Um, we've created a lot of vaccine materials and I wanna tell you all that you are welcome to use these. They are publicly available. Um, and I know that um, Jake and the team are gonna share the slides. So um, if you don't write quickly, don't worry, you'll be able to go back to the slide and look but um, we've put them all in a Dropbox folder. So we've got, a, oops, and the slide just auto advanced, sorry. Um, the, uh, the Dropbox folder has infographics, slide decks, social media posts, a whole set of animated videos. Um, these infographics, like some of the ones I've been sharing on our slides. Um, so all of these, shoot, why is it advancing? Um, all of these materials are available and you can access them anytime. And we would also love to have you follow us on social media. We post things there all the time and you're welcome to share, retweet, all, all of the social media tricks. Um, and you can follow us on our website as well. Uh, oh, thank you, Jake, for getting that in the chat. Much appreciated. Um, PreventCOVID.org is our website home and you can follow all the information there as well. So um, lots of ways to follow our work, access those tools, anything that you find in that Dropbox folder, you are welcome to use. It is free, download it, print it, hand it out, share it in your social media. If you wanna turn it into a flyer, go right ahead. It is, it is publicly available. So we, we wanna get it out there to anyone who wants to use it. And there will be new materials added all the time. Um, we're, we're just starting to, to put together our uh, materials about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, for example. So I know there'll be more things coming. Some thank yous to all the people that helped put all of this together. And um, I'm going to leave this last slide up that has that Dropbox link. Um, and, oh or I thought I was, but it just auto advanced. So maybe it's thinking for me. Um, let me now turn my attention to the questions. So the first one that I saw was in the Q and A from Nikki. Once my office mate and I are both fully vaccinated and have taken the recommended time, that means we can work together in the office without masks, correct. If you have, if everybody in the group is vaccinated, it is okay to be indoors without masks. Um, if you're in common areas where you may be interacting with people that have not been fully vaccinated, that would be when masks are really important. Um, and the same goes at, um, in your own home and visiting with friends or visiting with relatives. Um, if, if you, you know, are with the people that are sort of in your bubble or in your pod, it's okay to take your mask off. But if you want to visit with others, masks are a good idea. Um, you know, if, if grandma and grandpa have been vaccinated and they want to come over and see the grandkids, that's okay. We still recommend masks just for caution's sake. Um, I saw a really sweet uh, question that someone submitted to the New York Times um, from a, an elderly person who said, you know, my, we're both over 75. Uh, my boyfriend and I haven't seen each other this year. We haven't been able to share a kiss. Now we've both been vaccinated. You know, is it okay for us to have a smooch? And the New York Times response was, we've consulted with all of these uh, doctors and they all say, smooch away. So <laughs> it, it really is about um, 
trying to ask the question and confirm are the people that you're thinking of being um, in a room with or in close contact with people that have been vaccinated, are they in your bubble, outside the bubble, uh, and thinking about that. Um, Debbie just asked, you know, are people going to need to get a COVID vaccine yearly? So that's the question we still don't know yet. That's really about time. Um, it also may be about the mutations. It, um, if the studies show that we maybe need to get a booster shot that recognizes whatever the new variant mutation strain is, um, that would be another reason that a, um, an annual shot might be needed. That's the case with the flu. We know that the flu has a different strain going around every year. And that's why you need to get a different shot uh, for the flu every year. So same kind of situation uh, could turn up for COVID. We just don't know yet. Okay, let me look back now in the chat box. Um, oh, Debbie reposted her question. Thank you. I think. People are liking uh, community immunity. Great, it's kind of fun to say. I have to, I trip over my tongue a little bit. Um, I think I've hit all the questions that I see, but um, I wanna encourage folks to um, go ahead and put any new ones that, that come up. Uh, I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen so that I can go back to my email or Jake, if you have the uh, other questions that people had sent in advance and you want to pitch them to me, please. Oh, sure. I can, I can pull those up. And meanwhile, Gail, I think there's one more in the chat here. Um, and folks, feel free if there's questions that you have, or if there's things that you're hearing from people that you want to be able to speak to, Go yeah. ahead and put those in. If anybody wants to use the raise hand and ask it out loud, you can do that too. Sure. And, uh, I'll pull up the other ones, Gail. Yeah, so we've got the first set of data from Pfizer um, showing protection against asymptomatic cases. So that would be good because that would mean that yes, it's less likely that transmission is gonna occur. If, if you don't show any symptoms, if there's no sniffles, that may mean that there's not virus in your nose. Um, the studies that they've done with that have mostly been done in the lab. They've not been a, a clinical trial just yet. Um, so it's, it's still early days. I don't think we have a, a really solid answer just yet, but it's, it's trending in the right direction. Let me say it that way. It's, it's certainly looking promising. Um, and if it's true for Pfizer, is it true for the other vaccines? That is a fantastic question because each of these products is unique. And we have to make sure that we study them uniquely. So great question, way to be um, a discerning consumer of news. Um, and uh, that's really important. So we're gonna have to answer this question for each company's vaccine individually. Uh, let's see, so that was from Courtney, thank you. Let's see, Jill, once fully vaccinated, if someone has symptoms, is it still recommend they get tested? Yeah. So we want to continue to encourage testing. This has been a really interesting development in the last couple of weeks. Um, people have gotten so excited about vaccination, they kind of have forgotten about testing. So testing is still hugely important because there are all sorts of illnesses that start with a sniffle, a fever, having aches and pains, not feeling so great. That could be all sorts of different kinds of illnesses. So it's really important to know which type of illness you have, to know which type of treatment you might need. So if, if you have any of those symptoms and, and the CDC has these all listed on their website, uh, you can check the CDC for the, the most up-to-date list of symptoms to monitor. Um, that, you know, absolutely go get tested as quick as you can. Uh, the testing should be free. Um, we, um, they're not supposed to be charging. They, they, they may ask you if you have insurance and then charge your insurance company, but they shouldn't charge you. Um, the, uh, so yeah, absolutely testing, testing. Um, is it, you know, quarantining? 
again, still important. If you're not feeling well, the best thing you can do is stay away from other people. So, you know, there, there's always um, caveats that come with that. If you are responsible for caring for someone else, um, you know, if, if you work in a sort of job where you don't get time off when you're sick and you're trying to balance, I really need to go to work and, and you know, get paid but I really don't feel great. You know, you really wanna be cautious about that and try to use your best judgment. Um, if you feel like your symptoms are getting worse or your fever's getting higher, really please stay home. If you have a fever, you're contagious. Um, and those are the kinds of things we really wanna be mindful of. Um, you know, the best thing you can do is to try to, you know, hide yourself away in a room with no one else. And, and only come out if needed, you know, to, to use the bathroom. And then you want to think about getting Clorox wipes to wipe the doorknob and to wipe the faucet and prevent spreading germs to other people. Um, other questions? Jake, do, was there anything else that people send in ahead that you see? Let's see, you, you may have touched on these already. Um, I think one thing is people just want as much as much information as possible about the new guidelines for what can people do once they're vaccinated, that's different from before. Uh, and then there were a couple questions about, can you still transmit the virus if you're vaccinated and is it possible to get COVID if you're vaccinated? Yeah. So we, we definitely think that it is possible to get COVID even after you've been vaccinated. And again, that's because we just don't know if the vaccines will prevent against infection. So it's out there as a possibility. I think it becomes a smaller possibility. You know, the, the likelihood goes down if you've been fully vaccinated, but we haven't ruled it out entirely. So we still wanna use good common sense. And, and again, that's why even if you've gotten your vaccines, masking, distancing, you know, trying to limit the size of the groups that you're in, good hand washing, all of those same kinds of public health recommendations are important. The thing that really changes after vaccination is the potential to gather with larger groups or to um, not wear masks if everybody present has been fully vaccinated. That's really the key change. So, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, I've been working from home and I'd really like to go back into the office, you know, that becomes realistic. Uh, if you're thinking, you know, it'd be really nice to have grandma and grandpa over for family dinner, that becomes realistic. Um, if you're like me and you're just a single adult living by yourself and you would just really love to talk to another adult human being face-to-face -face instead of on Zoom, that becomes realistic, right? So those are the kinds of, of changes post-vaccination that you can be thinking about. But we still want to be really, I think, just sort of, you know, appropriately cautious and remember all those public health measures, you know, masks, hand washing, distancing, those are all about really protecting other people. So even if you've been vaccinated, I would say assume that there's a chance that you could still get infected. And because there's a chance you want to protect others. So, you know, I, I, what's the, there's an old slogan about, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Anything we can do to prevent illness in the first place is probably worth our time uh, because COVID is nasty business. Gail, any, um, any data or information on possible long-term effects of the vaccine? Yeah, so this is really interesting. What we're seeing so far, and again, we have, you know, uh, we started these efficacy trials. Uh, well, Moderna, the, the early stage trials started about a year ago. And then these large 30 person trials started like last July. So we have, you know, maybe eight or nine months of data at this point, not exactly long term. Um, historically, what we know about vaccines is that they're really safe and that there aren't long-term safety issues. Um, and that's because the way the vaccines are made, again, is this idea that they're sort of degrading in your body 
really right from the minute they're administered. You know, as that liquid in the syringe gets into you and starts to heat up with your body temperature, the components start to fall apart. So it's going to get into your cells. It's going to teach your cells how to make that protein so that your immune system knows what to do. Um, and then it kind of fades away. There's really not any vaccine left in your body after a few days. So there historically have not been concerns about long-term safety. And that's why you're seeing recommendations now, for example, that um, people who are pregnant, probably okay to get vaccinated. Um, I've seen recommendations coming out of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, that if you are living with cancer, probably okay to get vaccinated. Um, you know, again, I think it's always good to just consult with your own doctor and Make sure that somebody who knows you and your particular health concerns um, gives you sound medical advice. I am not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. Um, I, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to get into a boxing match with your physician. Um, but uh, you should definitely follow, you know, the guidance of your own provider. I think one last question here, Gail, that I see that you haven't um, talked about yet, and. I don't know, it is uh, just about the distribution and how, like, why has it been so hard to get? Do you have <laughs> insight into that? And if that's yeah, this is just a bugger. This is one, of, you know, this is one of those things where you, there are some things that you just can't do faster and making vaccines is one of them. Um, the time that it takes to manufacture and get the vaccine in all the little glass vials just takes the time that it takes. And it goes through lots of quality steps where they're checking sure that it, to make sure it's sterile and that it is stable and it has met all of those kinds of criteria. Um, and personally, I, I wouldn't want them to rush that part. That seems really important to me. Um, but the piece that you don't think about is that it's not just making the liquid that goes in the vial. It's also making all the little glass vials and all the little special rubber stoppers that top them and all the syringes and needles that you poke into that vial to draw up a dose of vaccine. And the, the little rack that the vials sit in so that they can be transported safely and all the little freezer packs and cooler boxes and the, all of that cold chain equipment, right? So this, this whole supply chain has lots of moving pieces. And that is in many cases where we have kind of fallen down and, and been unprepared. Um, but part of it is also that we were prepared. It's just how we listen to the information. So I remember going back to November when we first heard that Pfizer and Moderna um, had uh, you know favorable outcomes in their studies and they were going to apply to the FDA. And the first thing we heard was is there'll be 20 million doses in December. And everybody went, whoopee. And those of us who work in the field said, but there are 375 million people in the United States. 20 million doses is peanuts. And that continues to be where we are now. We're getting better. And with more companies having their vaccines available, we're getting doses quicker and quicker because there's just more in the pool, right? Um, one of the things that I heard with a lot of enthusiasm uh, just within the past week or two, you might have heard uh, President Biden announced that Merck, the company Merck, had agreed to partner with Johnson & Johnson in manufacturing their vaccine. And this was really important because ordinarily these are two companies that compete with each other, but Merck has not been making a COVID vaccine. So they didn't have any, any skin in the game, so to speak. Um, and so they have agreed to use their manufacturing capacity to manufacture the Johnson & Johnson product. Well, that means that we now have two companies manufacturing capacity. So that's gonna get our doses faster and faster. 
And Merck also is giving its, they call it fill and finish uh, facility. And so that's the place where they put the liquid in the little glass vial and package it up to ship it out, right? So it's not just the making the vaccine, it's, it's getting it in the, in, the, in the glass bottle. So that's the sort of stuff that we're hearing about now. And what I continue to hear is that, um, and I'm hearing it from Dr. Fauci, which leads me to believe that's pretty reliable information, is that we really think that by like June, we should be able to get all adults that want a vaccine vaccinated. And um, that, that is looking to be a realistic timeline. Um, and so, you know, as we know that we have these limitations on the available doses, we continue to roll them out in this sort of stepwise fashion. So Jake, as you mentioned at the top of the call, we, we are opening up to this next tier. Uh, I believe it was Wednesday, the 17th. Um, so now we've got, you know, a whole, uh, a whole nother group of essential workers that have been defined uh, here in Washington that'll become eligible. Um, I imagine that what we will then hear is there aren't enough appointments available and we'll be hearing people, you know, struggle with that, right? What, it's kind of a never ending cycle, but, um, but that's what's happening. So it's, you know, we just kind of have to keep pressing forward. We have to kind of remember to be patient. Um, and I'm glad that I don't have to be the one to decide what order the groups go, because that is just a thankless task. Well, Gil, thank you so much for your time. This has been just incredibly informative. I learned a ton. Uh, I hope this is helpful for everybody. We're gonna get the um, we're gonna get this recording out to you as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and again, like I said at the beginning, if folks have other questions, especially about you know how this is gonna roll out in your programs or in your community, please reach out to the coalition for that. Um, Gail shared some great resources that you can share with other with other people in your um, circles. Um, and like I said, also Judy's been doing a lot of a lot of um, outreach to program directors with updated information. Everything we're hearing, everything we're finding out about how this applies to programs, we're passing on to directors. So you should be getting that as well. Um, and please reach out and let us know how it's going. If you're finding things that work for you, we want to know that too. Yeah, we really really appreciate your time. That's beautiful. <laughs> Trust Dr. Fauci. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. I'm glad it was helpful. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.